So I work for the British Retail Consortium. We represent the retail sector. Uh, we say 80, 85% of all retailers from the largest through to the smallest. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for retail in terms of skills is uh, about bringing people into the workforce at, at the lowest level. So basic numeracy, literacy, uh, turning up on time skills. That's a big challenge for the retail sector and something where a lot of time and energy is spent. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about green skills. And I want to talk about products. To my knowledge, the Retail Sector Skills Council hasn't identified green skills as a particular issue. So this isn't something that's particularly high profile for the sector, but I just see that as one of the challenges that we face here. I want to talk about products for a few reasons. Firstly, um, it, it's a massive impact. We estimate that retail is about 3 3.5% three of UK climate emissions, but we think that products in their life cycles globally account for about a third of all of our carbon emissions. And then there's the associated issues, water, resource scarcity, etc. I think retail is well-placed uh, to address that, has a responsibility, uh, possibly an obligation to manage that. And if we want to meaningfully contribute to climate targets to 2050, we need to focus on products. I think the other reason just to look at products as a sector is because that's what we do. Um, there's, a, there's a risk as a sector and up for each of the businesses within the sector, that if they don't change the way they source products, it will be harder and harder for them to put those products on the shelves and certainly harder for them to do so at a good price as we see resource scarcity, water scarcity, price of oil, availability, etc. The less reliant you are on those, impact, uh, on those materials, on the uh, inputs, then uh, the more likely you are to be able to offer good quality products at a good price come 2050. In terms of skills, I think there's three areas where we need to uh, move forwards. First, leadership. We need a vision of where we're going to go. And I think we've, we've already seen a couple of examples of leading businesses um, where there is some leadership about where we're going to go. But I think a collective vision of where we are heading to in 2050 and the path we're going to take to get there is a very powerful thing um, and very, very important. The second is innovation. If we are to radically reduce the impact of our products by 80, 90% by 2050, we're going to have to completely change the way in which we source those products. Not only are we going to have to teach the skills to individuals to innovate, to be creative, to have ideas, but we're going to have to have an environment that fosters those ideas, that facilitates those people to communicate that within the business, to apply that, and to put that throughout the supply chain. The third, I think, is on uh, technical and operational capacity. Um, so it's one thing to understand how to do a life cycle assessment. It's another thing to understand how to interpret that and then how to apply that within the business. And then certainly for retailers and large retailers in particular, how do you then cascade that down through literally tens of thousands of suppliers where they don't necessarily have the capacity? And, and a particular challenge there is that very often the suppliers are small, medium-sized enterprises. They don't have the time, they don't have the resources, they don't have the expertise, um, they're trying to meet your, your demands as a customer rather than necessarily upskilling uh, in particular to meet a sustainability goal of their corporate customer. To put another challenge within that is that we talk quite a lot about green skills, about green jobs, but actually the growth will come within existing jobs rather than new jobs. So at an SME, they won't take someone on on the environment side. They will have to integrate sustainability and environmental issues within each of the parts of that business. So it would be adding things to existing jobs. If we, can't, if we struggle to communicate messages to SMEs, how are we going to get those SMEs to upskill and how are we going to get them to do that whilst remaining competitive and putting more sustainable products on the shelves at a better price? I, th I think there are solutions. And, and for me, the, the biggest single solution lies in collaboration and, again, common themes. Um, we know that collaboration can be a, a very powerful tool to harness uh, environmental sustainability. We have experience of it, and I want to talk about that in a minute. I think one of the reasons that it can be so powerful is that um, when corporate customers, when businesses, large businesses, ask for similar things over similar timescales, there's a greater case for the supply chain to do something about it. We, we've heard about M&S. M&S are less than 5% of the food market. If they start asking for changes as a supplier, well, they're 5% of your business, give or take. So, so what are you going to do about that? Whereas if M&S, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Asda, Morrison's are all asking for roughly the same thing at the same time, you've got a bigger case. You're going to take action. We have experienced collaboratively, and I want to speak 
uh, about just one example, if I can, and that's the Courtauld commitment, which started off in 2005. The focus of the commitment was to reduce the weight of packaging and to reduce food waste arising in the home. We're quite blunt metrics, and actually, when we look back at it now, the, the targets to reduce food waste in the home weren't particularly stretching. The second phase of the Courtauld commitment was more sophisticated. It looked at reducing the carbon impacts of packaging. It also looked at reducing food waste in the home, and there were more stretching targets, as well as reducing food and packaging waste in the supply chain. So over a period of five years, we made a move, and we became more sophisticated and more ambitious. We're now talking in 2012 about a, a possible successor, and we've moved away from Courtauld as a language towards uh, product sustainability. So the, the, the uh, initiative is now called the Product Research Forum, and, and we plan to rename as the Product Sustainability Forum, which hopefully gives you, gives you a better idea of what we're trying to achieve. We're talking about how we can improve the environmental impact of products. So we've moved away from packaging to whole products. We know packaging is about 6% of the life cycle of a product on average. So let's look at the products and not just the packaging. Um, so... Uh, a long, a long distance traveled. In terms of environmental impact, we're looking at water use, carbon, resources, waste. We're looking at a much broader spectrum than just weight of packaging. What that collaborative forum does is it provides us with leadership. It provides us with a vision of where we're going to go. And, and once we get more sophisticated and we ta start talking about products, that's a really valuable vision. And it's not just from one or two leading businesses. It's collectively across retailers and brands in the UK. What that vision then does is it starts to provide us with a, a mechanism to drill down and to upskill in terms of innovation and in terms of um, technical and operational capacity. So looking at packaging, we've seen some really, really big innovations since 2005 with changes in material, changes in packaging format, and latterly some of the innovation comes at, at at a really cutting edge. So, for example, in strawberries now, a number of retailers have a nano strip inside the packaging that absorbs the ethylene from the strawberries as they ripen, so that they, they ripen more slowly, so those strawberries last longer, so they're more likely to get eaten. That's a fantastic innovation. As, as we roll that out across a whole range of perishable foods, that will radically reduce food waste. That innovation arguably wouldn't have happened if we hadn't come together and set a direction as an industry. Again, you, you talk to people within the packaging industry, and they will tell you we've got one of the most sophisticated, one of the most innovative packaging industries in the world. And I believe that is a direct result of us having come together, talked about where it is we're trying to go, and then we've drilled down innovation, and we've, and we've drilled down operational and technical capacity through that supply chain to all of those packaging providers. And they've upskilled as a response to their customers demand, the big retailers, the big brands, demanding that they do things in a different way. So in summary, there's a long way to go. We've got some radical changes uh, that will take place. But uh, if we come together as large businesses to provide leadership, we will get innovation and we will get operational and technical capacity building through those supply chains in response. <laughs>